be free. Be free. Amen. Or how hard 
while we try to live good and moral lives, we cannot earn salvation or remove our sin. Only Christ can save us. Right. Our sin points out our need to be forgiven and cleansed. Amen. So it's really a dangerous thing if we have placed in our minds that we are above sin. Amen. Because that means that we feel like we don't have to be forgiven, that we feel like there's no cleansing needed. And that's a dangerous thing. Although we don't deserve it, God in his kindness reached out to love and forgave us. And not only that, he provides a way for us to be saved. John 3.16 says that God loved us so much that he gave his only son. Christ's death paid the penalty for our sin. Amen. It is good news that God saves us from our sin. But in order to enter into a wonderful relationship with God, we must believe that Jesus died for us and that he forgives all our sin. By God's power, believers are sanctified, made holy. This means we are set apart from sin, enabled to obey and to become more like Christ. Amen? Amen. Be free. When we are growing in our relationship with Christ, the Holy Spirit frees us from the demands of the law and from the fear of judgment. Because we are free from sin's control, the demands and fear of God's punishment, we can grow in our relationship with Christ. Amen? Amen. By trusting the Holy Spirit and allowing him to help us, we can overcome sin and temptation. So, somebody probably thinking right now, well, how can uh, I allow the Holy Spirit? How do I know when the Holy Spirit is even talking to me? How can I allow him to do something when I don't know that he is speaking to me? Each and every believer has the indwelling Holy Spirit. And that is that inner voice that comes to us when we are about to say some things or do some things that we know are not like God. Then that's when he, the Holy Spirit, will whisper and say, don't do it. Don't say that. Don't go right, go left. Amen. Amen. So when we allow him, when we hear him, and we follow his direction, that's when we can overcome sin and temptation. Amen? Amen. Because we're not above sin, and we're not above temptation. But the good news is that we can overcome it. Amen? Being made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. Service to God. Then comes conversion. What is conversion? Conversion is first a freedom from the service of sin. It is the shaking off of the yoke or whatever thing that is bound to you, that has you bound, resulting to have no more to do with it. You become sick and tired of being sick and tired. You've made up your mind that you're not going to do that thing anymore. Amen? And just so it's clear, it's not an instantaneous thing. <laughs> when you try to overcome some bad habit that you have, uh -huh. it's not going to happen instantly. First, you make up in your mind, you resolve in your mind that you don't want to do it anymore. You tell God that you're sorry and that you want to be helped. And then there's a gradual yeah. change that comes about. Amen. It's a process. Okay? Your deliverance will be a process. You will find yourself doing less and less of that thing that has you bound. Amen? Now somebody right now should be free. Amen? That right there alone can set somebody free. It's a gradual process. So don't beat yourself up if it don't happen overnight. Amen? Secondly, there is a submission, a resignation of ourselves to the service of God. 
and righteousness. To God is our master, to righteousness is our work. When we are made free from sin, it is not that we may live as we please and be our own master. It's not. When we are delivered out of sin, delivered out of our Egypt, we are as Israel, led to the holy mountain to receive the law, and there brought into the bond of the promise. You see here, we cannot be made the service of God until we are free from the power and dominion of sin. We cannot serve two masters so directly opposite one to another as God and sin are. Matthew 6 and 24 says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Man is money. It simply means you cannot serve God in riches, greed, and worldly gain personified as a false god. Right. Material wealth regarded as evil. We must, like the prodigal son, quit the drudgery of the citizen of the country before we come to our father's house. Right. We must realize our former work and way has left us uneasy and fearful about our future. Amen? Amen. In verse 21, Paul asked the question whether they had not found the service of sin fruitful. One, an unfruitful service. He asked the question, what fruit had you then? Uh -huh. What did you profit? Did you get anything by it? Okay, what he was saying was, what fruit did you have at the time in the things of which you are now ashamed? You did what you did, and now you're feeling bad about it. You're actually feeling ashamed about the things that you did. So sit down and count it up. Measure up the cost. Was it worth it? Did you reap anything? Besides the future losses, which are infinitely great, the very present gains of sin are not worth mentioning. What fruit? Nothing that deserves the name of fruit. The present pleasure and profit of sin do not deserve to be called fruit. Amen? A lot of things that we do, and a lot of, and I, and I'm not, when I say we, I don't mean us here in transformation. I mean us as a people, us as a world. A lot of gain, uh, fortune that we get, we don't get it by any good means. We get it by cheating people, people out here robbing somebody, you know what I'm saying? The, the Bernie Madoff scheme, you know what I'm saying? All this type of stuff, evil. Evil. The present pleasure and profit of sin do not deserve to be called fruit. They are the sham plowing iniquity, sowing vanity, and reaping the same. Paul goes on to say, it is an unbecoming service. It is that of which we are now ashamed. Ashamed of the folly, ashamed of the filth of it. Shame came into the world with sin. Amen. And it is still the certain product of it, either the shame of repentance, or if not that, eternal shame and contempt. In the book of Genesis, Adam did not know anything about sin until he did what God told him not to do and ate from the tree that God told him not to eat. And then he realized he was naked. Okay, because he had sinned. He had went against the will of God. And what did he do? He got shame and he covered himself up. And that's what sin does. It makes us shameful. He argues that from the end of all these things, it is the prerogative, the prerogative of rational creatures that they are endued with a power of prospects are capable of looking forward considering the latter end of things. To persuade us from sin to holiness, here are blessings and cursing, good and evil, life and death set before us, and we are put to our choice. God gave us a choice, amen? amen. He don't want to force it on us. He gave us a choice, so we can choose right from wrong. We can choose to be good or evil, amen? The end of sin is death. The end of those things is death. Though the way may seem pleasant and inviting, yet the end is dismal. And sin do feel good. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. When I was out there, I had a ball. Okay? It felt good. Because that's what sin does. It feels 
good. But that don't mean it's right. Amen? Hmm. If Christ died for sin once for all and dies no more, so should we die to sin once and live unto God forever. Here sin is pictured as a king or a tyrant who has the soul passions, spirit faculties, and bodily members of a man under control, dominating his life. Let him not work or reign in the mortal body. Give him no place or ground for working in your being. Amen. Sin does not rule or ruin. Sin rules and ruins. Okay? So don't think it's going to be, well, maybe I just, uh, nah, uh. no. It's going to destroy you. Sin will ultimately destroy you. If you become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and it's in eternal life. The immediate consequence of our new service is a life which begins to bear the marks of holiness. The ultimate consequence is eternal life. But eternal life is also, in part, a present experience. It is strict equivalent. It, it is it's strict equivalent. It's not life forevermore. It is a new quality. Life touched in the kinship with the life of God because it belongs to the realm of the reality. It is not at the mercy of chances and changes and is therefore everlasting. Amen. Amen. Sin itself has lust other than the lust of man. Okay, this thing is deep. Okay. The lust of sin are in reality the lust of Satan. John 8, 44, Jesus says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stayed not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Amen. So when you practice in sin, you are actually living for Satan. He is your God. He is your king. The lust of man are his own creative powers, depraved and corrupt. Amen. Be that what the devil made me do it. Okay. You chose to go with the devil. They make up the basic Adamic nature. We were born in sin. The same faculties that yield to sin can likewise yield to God and commit holy acts. You have a choice. Amen? Be free. It is impossible to be neutral. Revelations 3, 15 and 16. Jesus sent word by the angel to the church of Sardis he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that ye be cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Amen. And yeah, we got some cold, we got some, some Christians that straddle in the fence. That's what it means. That's what it means. I'm telling you exactly what it means. Okay, you get with this group of people and they don't do nothing but sin, so you sin with them. Then on Sunday morning, you come to church and you get around the saints, and now you a saint. So you, whatever win or doctrine that come back, that's where you go go. You know, you just straddling the fence. Okay? This, this group over here cussing, you cussing too, because you got to fit in. This group over here drinking, you drinking too, because you got to fit in. You know what I'm saying? This group over here, all they do is have promiscuous sex, so that's what you're going to do, because that's who you with. And then you get over here with the saints in Bible study, and you a Christian. <laughs> that's what Jesus meant when he said cold or hot. He don't want you lukewarm. He wants you to choose. Either you're going to be on this side, or you're going to be on this side. Either you're going to choose 
Satan is your king and sin, or you go choose God and his son Jesus and the work that Jesus did and try to live your life according to his will and his way. Every person has a master, either God or sin. <laughs> Somebody should get free back then. Man. <laughs> a Christian is someone, a Christian is not someone who cannot sin, but someone who is no longer a slave to sin. Okay? Now that ought to make some that ought to make that ought to make this a lot easier for somebody. Okay, it doesn't mean that you cannot sin. It means that you've made the choice not to practice sin. And you belong to God. The wages of sin is death. Death is due to a sinner when he has sinned as wages. As wages are to a servant when he has done his work. This is true of every sin. There is no sin in its own nature easily excused or forgiven. Okay, you got faith Christ, right? Death is the wages of the least sin. Amen? And I'm talking about, the, the, the scriptures talk about even before you lay down and close your eyes for the final time, the scriptures talk about a spiritual death. Because we know sin separates us from God. I told you that earlier. A spiritual death. You cannot be a part of God's family until you choose to live your life for him. You're dead. God can't even look at sin. When Jesus was on the cross dying for our sin, when he took on our sin to carry, God turned his back. Because he can't look at sin. Amen? Sin is here represented either as the work for which the wages are given or as the master by whom the wages are given. All that are sin's servants and do sin's work must expect to be paid. If the fruit be unto holiness, if there be an active principle of true and growing grace, the end will be everlasting life, a very happy ending. Though the way be uphill, Though it be narrow and thorny and beset, yet everlasting life is at the end of it for sure. So when you choose to go God's way, it does not mean that everything is going to be perfect. You're going to have some bumps and bruises along the way. Amen. But you can rest assured that God is with you. And he's going to make sure that everything comes out all right. He's always at the other end of whatever it is that we're going through. And you just hang on in there. And you keep on doing God's will. And you will have eternal life. Amen? So the gift of God is eternal life. Heaven is life consisting in the vision and fruition of God. And it is eternal life. Eternal life, no sickness or old age diseases will be there. No death to put a period to it. You're going to live perpetually forever and ever. This is the gift of God. The death is the wages of sin. It comes by punishment or by what you deserve, if you will. But the life is a gift. It comes by favor. Sinners merit hell. Sinners earn hell, but saints do not merit heaven. Saints cannot earn heaven. There is no proportion between the glory of heaven and our obedience. We must thank God and not ourselves if we ever get to heaven. Amen? It is Christ that purchased it, prepared it, prepares us for it, preserves us to it. He is the Alpha and Omega, all in all in our salvation. Amen? It's because of what Christ did. Amen? Eternal life is a gift from God. If it is
is a gift, then it is something that we cannot earn, nor something that we must pay back. It's kind of crazy for someone who receives a gift out of love and then offers to pay for it. Yeah, right. A gift cannot be purchased by the recipient. Yeah. A more appropriate response to a loved one who offers a gift is graceful acceptance and gratitude. Yeah. Amen. Right. And that's why we gather here week after week to give God gratitude, to show him gratitude, yeah. to tell him thank you, yeah. to give him praise. Thank you.